a day and what a time. It's such a good time that we can be able to look into the Word of God and be able to reason together in the words of Christ. We are specifically handling a series on prayer. Let's go straight to the Word of God. In Matthew chapter number 6, this is where we find the portion of scripture or the episode which attention is called upon or what we've been studying. And therefore, I just want to read it out even as we begin dealing with matters ahead of us. And uh, let's read the scriptures. In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. We've been looking at that prayer that Jesus taught. I have said time and again, there are many places where we can get to understand or to learn matters in this regard of prayer. But we would rather learn from what Jesus taught. And no wonder the disciples, having seen his lifestyle and his victorious life of prayer, they went to him and asked him, Master, John taught his disciples how to pray. Why don't you teach us also how to pray? And by extension to us in the church and those who have come to the faith, to the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is our honest desire that the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus, teaches us how to pray. And we've come a long way learning on this very matter, how to position ourselves even in prayer as Jesus taught, and how to approach the whole scenario of prayer. And we have discovered that that which Jesus taught provides a template of prayer for us, a pattern for us that we can be able to organize our prayers scripturally and do it in the manner that Jesus taught. And what a joy if we can pray scripture back to God, if we can actually stand before God and tell him, God, this is what your word says, and we make supplication, we entreat God based on those words. Please don't forget this. Prayer, as we have discovered from its foundational word in the book of Genesis chapter number 20, verse number 7, has to do with a person entreating God for the sake of another, that their lives be saved. We also looked at the same thought when Jesus started teaching about prayer. He prayed or he taught that as a person prays, that they pray particularly to those who spitefully misuse or abuse them, not with a heart to destroy them, but pleading or entreating God that their lives be saved as well. So when you connect the two thought lines, both from the Old Testament in the first mention of the word pray, and what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter number 5 and 4, going forward all the way to chapter number 6, you will realize these are synonymous. They are speaking the same thing. That prayer has to do with entreating God or making supplication unto God that the life of another be spared or not be destroyed. Praise the name of Jesus. And when we organize it in that way, then it obtains results. We also noted that as we stand before God, we got to cut a clear-cut distinction in between the hypocritical way of prayer and the real disciple of Jesus Christ way of prayer. The hypocrites only seek for people or for men's commentation in their place of prayer. And even when they go ahead and do their alms or their giving, they give to attain a reward from human beings. They do it to be seen. They do it to go into the records of me, to be recognized, you know, to be heaped up praises of men. But Jesus said, when you pray as a disciple of Christ, seek that reward 
that abounds in your heavenly account. And I think that's really very important that we pray with a view of storing up something in the heavens. And therefore, when he started to teach about this whole business of prayer, there are a couple of things that he calls attention to, and I really, really like this. He said when you pray, the first thing that you need to do is to go to your Father in heaven. That is the first segment of prayer. Pray to the Father in heaven. And in this we discovered there are a couple of things. There must exist uh, some sort of relationship in between the Son and the Father. A functional Father-Son relationship so as to obtain results in the place of prayer. Without that approach, it may not be easy to obtain answers to your prayer. I said last time and I will say today, God is not a supermarket where you will walk in and collect things and pay and walk out. No, God is not a free market where you are freely able to go and do your stuff there. No, 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 no. Our God looks for a functional father-son relationship when it comes to mother's prayer. Hallelujah. And he has ordained that his Holy Spirit teaches us on how to cry, Abba, Father. When we come through the Lord Jesus Christ, because we discovered Jesus is the door, or is the gateway to getting to know the Father. And after getting to know the Father through Jesus Christ, according to uh, John chapter number 14, verse number 6, then you come to the knowledge of the Spirit of God, who teaches us how to Come to the Father. Hallelujah. And when we come to the Father, we find of inheritance. Jesus is a doorway. Holy Spirit teaches us how to come to the Father. And the Father gives us of his inheritance. Very, very important. The three are inseparable. And you cannot do without the three. And in this whole matter of prayer, the three are interconnected if we're going to obtain results in our praying. Hallelujah. So, Having dealt with that approach of our Father in heaven, of course, coming before the Father in an honorable way, because if a son dishonors the Father, then he would not expect in return to obtain anything from the Father. So honor is one of the greatest elements in approaching the Father. The second thing, you begin now to address the needs of the Father. And we discovered in this prayer that there are three needs of God when it comes to prayer. And you just don't rush into your need before you address his need. Hallelujah. The first need of the Father is that the Father desires that his name be hallowed. And that's why he prayed, he asked, when he said, when you pray, pray, hallowed be your name. Hallelujah. The second one is pray that his kingdom, oh, thy kingdom come. That is the need of God. And then the third thing is pray that his will be done here on earth as it is done in heaven. Now, having addressed the three needs of God, then God gives you his open arms to present your needs or to bring before him all your needs, like give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts. Those are your personal needs. But before you come to your personal needs, address the needs of the Father. Hallelujah. The first need of God, hallowed be your name. And we discover that Israel did not hallow the name of God. And even today, the Jewish people do not hallow the name of God. But in God's economy, a time is coming when the whole of Israel, will actually have to hallow the name of God. Not only the nation of Israel, God has ordained in his own infinite wisdom that a time is coming when all the nations of the earth, every man, every woman in the face of the earth that God created will bow down and every knee shall knee, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, I would like us to move on to the, the second need of God. Jesus said, pray. And remember, we are learning prayer as Jesus taught. He said, when you pray, praying the second need of the Father, pray that thy kingdom come or your kingdom come. And this is really the very matter that I want this to call attention to even today in the minutes that are before us. That's exactly what I want us to deal with. Your kingdom come. 
Now, when we begin to talk about you, the kingdom of God coming, then this focuses on that day when his kingdom shall come and the certainty of it, the exact coming of that kingdom. Hallelujah. And for us to be able to look into that, there are a few thoughts that we need to put together so that we can actually be able to compare scripture with scripture and be able to find out this all matter of the coming of the kingdom. As a student of the word of God, I have come to realize that there exists such a great confusion within the body of Christ in this matter of the kingdom. And therefore, you find that in very different places, you have very different interpretations in regard to this very matter. Today, I do not suggest that I'll be bringing you the most perfect one. But I want to delve in the scriptures, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, and picking up a little from here and a little from there, line upon line, precept upon precept, and be able to pull out what I understand or what the scripture tells me about the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Now, when we talk about the kingdom, the thing here or the matter here in focus is the rule of, of the heavens over the earth. And how do you do, not, do you know that? The book of Daniel, chapter number 4, verse number 26, the Bible tells us that the heavens do rule. The heavens do rule. And that word heavens is pre presented in the Hebrew word Shamayim. Shamayim is a word given in plural form. Of course, talking about more than one heaven. So when we talk about the heavens, we are thinking of the different heavens that the scripture presents. The scripture tells us about the heavens declaring the glory of God. That is the first heaven, the blue sky that you and I see. Then it also talks about the second heaven where principalities and powers operate from or where rulership is dispensed from. And then again, Paul says that I knew a man from the third heaven. You know, he really doesn't understand, but he says he talks about a man that he knew 14 years caught up in the third heaven. When we look into the scriptures, we realize that the third heaven is actually the abode of God, the very place where God lives far above all the other heavens and in somewhere in the resources of the north according to the scriptures. And therefore, having noted that the heavens do rule, we see God reigns supreme above the heavens and then there is the second heaven where the rulership over the earth is actually dispensed from. When God first created the heavens and the earth according to Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens, again, Shamahim, and the earth. Meaning that God created the entire expansive universe with the earth included. That is perspective, or that is the scope in that which explains. And therefore, when he created, we see in the scriptures that God gave the rulership over the earth from heavens above to the angels. So the angels were created and given dominion over God's universal kingdom. Now, when we talk about God's universal kingdom, we're thinking beyond the earth. We are not limited to this planet again, because the work of God's universe expands to the entire scope of the universe. Think of the moons, think of the suns, think of the already identified planet, and many other unidentified flying objects, the galaxies, the what, what, what. Man has attempted to go to the space and find out about life in other, in other provinces that God created. It has not been practically possible to this end. Man continues to invent. But the one thing we know is that within God's expansive universe is one province known as the earth. In that earth, God ordained that life flows. God ordained that there will be a place where you will find all created things and the scripture focusing on. Now, the structure in which God ordained that it would rule in his kingdom, of course, covering the entire scope of the provinces of the kingdom. Please keep in mind that the earth is just one part 
of God's universal kingdom. I like what it this way, talking in simplicity to our people in the church. Because in our country, we think of counties. So the earth is like one county within a nation. <laughs> we have, in Kenya, we have 47 counties. And therefore, living in the county of Mombasa, we live in this one part of the kingdom of Kenya. Hallelujah. And therefore, when we now talk in regard to the earth, we're looking at the earth as one province or one county in God's universal kingdom. We discover that the realm in which the kingdom of God expands to, it is within the entire universe. And the earth is just one part of God's universal kingdom. It's one province within a kingdom. So it's one smaller portion of God's kingdom that God set up. Hallelujah. And in the leadership structure, in the structure of angelic governance over that, uh, over that um, uh, universe, God has, at this point in time, installed angelic rulership that they are the ones both in the heavens under God and also in the other provinces where God has actually placed uh, his structure. At the moment, God has put structures that are already occupied by angelic rulers. In this angelic rulership or in these structures, there are superior angels and subordinate uh, angels that rule in an hierarchical order. They rule in an hierarchical order. Some possessing higher positions and others possessing lesser positions of power and authority, but ruling on all those provinces of the universe as we have discovered. Now matters concerning the rulership of the earth, when God created in the beginning, we will realize they also are ruled from heavens above. Just like the other continents, it's something much similar to that which happened like it has happened with the others. And simply what we really need to understand is that God does not do things arbitrary. He is a God of order. He is a God of purpose. He is a God of objectivity. And when he set up the entire universe, he didn't create it in vain. He set up some sort of order within that scope. Now, if that is the governmental order within God's provinces that expand to different places over his universe, our focus or our attention does not go to the other, to the other provinces. Our attention is only called to this part of God's universal kingdom known as the earth. And I'm, I'm happy that you are following. You may need to play this video again and again so that you can get this properly. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, the one we know as Lucifer or as Satan, formerly known as Lucifer, but today he's known as Satan and his angels, they were given domain over the rulership of the earth when God created it. And God gave them a place of rulership from the heavens above over the earth. And that's what we see in scripture. And when we begin to look at that, we realize that angels continued ruling, or they were in rulership, or they have been in rulership until a certain point in time when Satan sinned and actually walked against the word of the Lord. Now, the Bible tells us in Isaiah in reference to Satan. And please, it's important to understand this. My very, very great disappointment is that most of us don't really understand Satan, who is our enemy. And therefore, because of careless attacks, because of careless approach of the one we know as Satan, there's been a lot of ignorance surrounding this whole matter on how to deal with this enemy, this one which we look at uh, 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 as the enemy. Let us look at Satan before he fell. Sometime in those ages of eternity past, God placed him, like we said, to, to a place over the earth to execute governance in the heavens. 
And when he put him in that place, he did not give him that authority alone. He gave him an entire contingent of angels to rule or to exercise positions of power and authority together with him. But the Bible tells us that a day came when Satan became dissatisfied with his appointed position and rebelled against God. And by rebelling against God, who is actually the appointing authority, or the supreme authority, or the supreme power that had put him into power, the Bible tells us that God rejected him. So what did Satan do? Satan sought to occupy a place above that which had been committed to him by God. As a matter of fact, what he wanted to do, he wanted to expand his domain, his domain of rulership beyond the one province that God had given him, the province of the earth. He also wanted power extended to other provinces, and he wanted to do so without God's appointment to that particular place of authority. Let's look at Isaiah chapter number 14, verses 12 to 15, and then we'll be able to get something here. How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground. You will lay the nations low. You say it in your heart, I will ascend to heaven and above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the reaches of the north. Another translation says, in the recesses of the north, where we found is the abode of God. And he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. He disqualified him. And that's why the scripture tells us that he fell from heavens and fell upon a sanctuary. I want to call my hearers and my viewers to go to the book of Ezekiel 28. And you begin to read from verses number 7 throughout the chapter. And you'll be able to realize this whole story and be able to learn a little more of what we're talking about. Praise the name of the Lord. Now this act that Satan you know, attempted to put in place of overthrowing God or taking more than what he had been committed brought him or brought about that disqualification. Satan became disqualified to rule even within the, prov within the province that God had placed him. God did not only stop him from extending his rule to other provinces, but also rejected him and disqualified him as the earth's ruler. And this is really very important for us to understand. But the very interesting thing is that even as a ruler, or being the ruler, he continued holding the scepter. Hallelujah. He continued holding the scepter. He did not relinquish the scepter immediately after that rejection. He continued holding the scepter. Somebody said there is a principle of biblical government that necessitates that an incumbent ruler may continue to hold his appointment or his appointed position until his replacement is not only on the scene but ready to ascend to the throne and hold that scepter. Hallelujah. That is an excerpt from somebody I know known as Alan Chidwana. I like that. That the incumbent ruler will not be forced to release of the scepter of, of authority until another ruler qualified to succeed him has been found. And this is exactly what we see with Saul and David. David was anointed to succeed a rejected king, that is Saul, but Saul continued holding the scepter of authority until David had been found qualified to lead. It took him about 13 years of waiting, even though anointed. Hallelujah. So after Satan's rejection, he continued holding on the scepter of authority simply because a replacement had not been immediately found. And therefore God had him continue holding the scepter of authority even though rejected. And um, the thing we see is that after that fall, some of the angels that ruled with Satan decided to actually follow Satan. And one third of them moved and went with Satan. The scripture tells us in Revelation chapter number 12 verse number 4 that two thirds of them did not go with Satan. Please mark that and go 
and read. Two thirds of the angels of heaven, they rejected to go onto the side of Satan. But one third of them went with Satan. Hallelujah. And therefore, the power structure of uh, the governance over the heavens and the earth got disrupted. You have uh, two thirds of angels in that structure that are not rebellious. But you have a third of the angels on this other side that have sided with the rejected ruler. Hallelujah. And therefore, there being, that being the case, a time came, according to Genesis, chapter number one, verse number two, following Satan's sin, the earth became without form and void. That which God had was set up as Satan's sanctuaries or a domain of rulership was actually, or as seen in scripture, got completely destroyed and brought to a point of, of ruins following Satan's fall. And we realize in Isaiah chapter number 45, verse number 18, that was not God's original idea. The earth was not created, or this one part of God's universal kingdom had not been created to be a place of ruins and chaos. It had been perfectly created for man's habitation or for habitation. But following Satan's fall, it got destroyed and was brought into a place of ruins. And therefore, what we see following is Satan continuing ruling while a rejected king, holding the scepter of authority until God finds a replacement for him. And this is exactly what we see happening in Genesis 1 or 26. When God, after rejecting Satan, God went ahead and said to the rest of the Godhead, let us create man in our own image and in our own likeness. And you see, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and everything that creeps on the face of the earth. In other words, God created man to be the exact replacement for Satan. Hallelujah. So God creates man in that order. Now, the other thing that we noted in that creation, this one that is to replace Satan is created differently from the relationship structure that has existed before. This one that will succeed the rejected ruler is not an angel. It is man created in the image and likeness of God. And in this new order that God is actually putting in place has to be done with what we find in scripture. And I love this. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And please get this because this is really very interesting. The scripture tells us that while after creating Adam, he saw, according to Genesis 2.18, that it was not good for man to be alone. And therefore God said, I'll create him or I'll make him a helpmeet comparable to him. So in matters rulership, God had now resolved to change the entire governmental structure in replacing that of the angels. And before Satan was replaced, the new order associated that a man don't rule alone. A man have a bride by his side. And therefore that's where God put Adam into a deep sleep according to Genesis chapter number 2 from verses number 23 down. And when he put him down into a deep sleep, God went to his side, opened the side, and after opening the side, he took one rim, and out of the rim that he took from the man's side, he made a woman, help me comparable to him, to be able to rule with a man. So the woman is created, not from the dust of the ground, but from the man's side. And that's why when you look at man and woman today, there's a whole lot of difference. Man has very hard kind of body form. And when you look at the woman, she has a tender, beautiful, soft body. <laughs> Why? Because she was not created from the dust of the ground. She was created from the part of man's body. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. No wonder the scripture calls the woman 
the weaker vessel because of the material that she is made of. And no wonder the scripture says that men have to handle their women with wisdom because they are looked at as the weaker vessels. In that sense, praise the name of the Lord. But I want you to notice something here. The intentions of the creation of man was that of rulership and nothing else. This is the purpose to which God created man for, to rule. And God saw it was not good for the man to rule alone. Therefore, he made him a woman that they can rule together. So that in this new order of rulership, it necessitates that a man have a bride in matters rulership. Hallelujah. Satan doesn't have a wife. So that regime of satanic rule had to be replaced by man with his bride in matters rulership. And therefore God puts man in the place of rulership in the garden. In an unfallen state. God wanted Adam and the woman to be found worthy in the garden. And you realize that to every leader that God appoints, they got to go through a test. And Satan knowing that this man had been created for the very purpose of replacing him. He started devising tactics of corrupting him and bringing him down. Satan knew for anyone to come down from God's ordained structure of leadership, all what they need to do is to engulf themselves in a nature of sin. And therefore, that being the Eden weapon, he went and found the woman. Remember, it is not Adam that was tempted, but the woman that was tempted. The scripture says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived. So Satan, to reach Adam and bring him down or to stop him from ascending to the place of rulership, he subtly went through the woman and deceived the woman and the woman had of the fruit. And when she ate of the fruit, she took it also to the husband. And Adam, knowing what God had said, and having remembered that he had made a confession, and he had said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. In the presence of God, he decided that if my woman has taken over the fruit, I will also eat of the fruit. Listen to me carefully. I've come to realize to every man that God gives a wife, the best way to resolve conflicts in the home is to take your woman's sin as yours. <laughs> to take your wife's sin as yours. She makes mistakes, you own it. The scripture tells us that Adam was a type of Christ, him that was to come according to the book of Romans 114. He was a type of him that was to come. And if Adam was a type of him was to come, what does the scripture tell us about Christ? 2 Corinthians 5 21. He who knew no sin was made sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Christ came for purposes of redeeming man from the yoke of sin. Hallelujah. Remember from the fall of Adam. All the way God was seeking for a redeemer. He was seeking for a way of redeeming man. And bring him to the position to which he had created him. The very reason why Adam did not ascend to the throne. Or why he didn't get the scepter from Satan. It's because he sinned before he ascended to the throne. And therefore, having not found a faithful replacement, Satan continued to hold the scepter of authority. Hallelujah. And throughout the scriptures, right from the fall of Adam, all the way to the call of Abraham, and going forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus coming and announcing that we need to repent, we need to come back, or announcing to the Jews that they need to come back to the very place where God wanted them to be, so that the keys of the kingdom or the scepter of authority can be handed over to the nation, he announced that the nation would not repent, would not accept until God put them aside and then God raised up the church, praise the name of the Lord, through the death and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. 
he who knew no sin being made sin, that we can become the righteousness of God. The intentions of Jesus going to the cross, because the scripture tells us that he was slain even before the foundation of the world. The intentions of Christ going to the cross was for the purposes of doing that the first Adam was not able to do and satisfy the claims of justice. But remember, because God had already instituted an order that in matters of rulership in his universe or in his kingdom, there has to be a man, and this man cannot rule alone. He has to have a bride. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So Jesus comes, the man Jesus, he dies and satisfies all the claims of justice. But then he didn't have a bride. He partied to purchase his bride with his own blood. So he shed his blood. See, this is how it happened. That Roman soldier, the Bible says, they struck Jesus on the side. And when they struck Jesus on the side, blood and water gushed out. The blood was possible for the purchasing of the bride. Because he would not rule alone in the kingdom. And then the water that gushed out of the side was necessary for the washing of the bride. So that she can just be like him. Now from the time Jesus died, was buried, and was raised up from the dead to this day. It's more than 2,000 years ago. Jesus has identified the one that would be his bride. And the thing he's been doing, he's been washing her by the water of the word. What we are doing now, for those of us who are saved are born again, we are being washed with the water of the word so that when the day cometh and we have been made properly clean, then we can ascend with him in the place of power. The Bible says, that he must rule until all God has put all these things under his feet. Look at this. Christ has ascended and sat at the right hand of the Father God. But he is without a bride. He has been waiting for the bride to be prepared. And once the bride has been prepared and is ready without sin, without spot, without any wrinkle or any such a thing, she will now qualify to rule in a, sinless, in a sinless state, just as that of Christ. And the two will be able to replace Satan. Hallelujah. To this day, including Jesus himself, Jesus acknowledged in Matthew chapter number 4, Satan as still the ruler of this world. The scripture tells us in Ephesians 2, verse number 2, this is about, uh, is about Paul. Paul says, when, wherein you walked according to the, to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit that now walks in the sons of disobedience. There is a spirit in the, the prince of the power of the air, within the structures of government in the heavenly places. And then in Ephesians 3.10, the scripture says to the intent that now unto the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places might be known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. And again Paul in Ephesians 6.12 he says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers and against rulers of darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. I would like you to see something. Up to today, in that realm, in this part of God's universal kingdom, there is still an order of rulership. But this is an angelic rulership under Satan. Satan did not hand over the scepter of authority. Why? Because man had not been justified, had not passed the test. And because Christ has done it all, man is now in the process of being justified. And you know what? Matters may continue in this order for some time, not for a whole period of time. And that's why now this connects to what we've been praying in the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus came and teaching his disciples, he taught his disciples, kept on saying, you know, repent for the kingdom of God is coming. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. He was talking about 
that rulership that is about to come, a change of governmental structure. Hallelujah. If Israel repented at that time, there would have been a change of structure of governance at that point in time. But Israel did not repent to the point that this offer was extended to the church. And after the offer was extended to the church, today the message continues that the church needs to repent because the kingdom of God is coming. Now there exists a confusion. When we begin to think of God as the universal ruler of the universal kingdom of God. It is true, when a person gets born again, they are born again into God's kingdom. Hallelujah. They are born again into God's kingdom. That should not be confused. But then, when Christ prayed, when you go to pray, say, Our Father in heaven, our Lord be your name, thy kingdom come. And this is what we're talking about. If the prayer is about that time when the current structure of governing rulers will be overthrown and there will be an exchange of governance. When Christ and a contingent of his believers, when Christ and his bride will ascend to the place of power and overthrow this governance that has to do with angels and put it aside. And a new order of rulership over the earth, over the heavens above, over the earth is installed. The scripture tells us as I come to the finish, in the book of Hebrews chapter number 2 verse number 5, that God has not put the world to come that we speak of. In other words, that which comes after the resurrection rapture of the church will not be under the rulership of the angels. Hallelujah. And the exciting thing about Believers and Christians, people under Christ, is that in that day, if they have fought their battle, if they have worked out their lives and organized itself, you know, in a manner that God requires, they will be overjoyed in taking a place of rulership with Christ in his coming kingdom. And that's why he prayed. As you pray, pray this need in the heart of the Father, that one day his kingdom comes. And when the kingdom of God comes here on earth and influences the earth, that which is being done in heaven will be the same thing that is being done on earth. Let me tell you today, today the scripture tells us in 1 John 5, 19, that the whole, we know we are of God, but the whole world is under the influence or the sway of the evil one. Let me tell you, God has not placed the world to come that we speak about under the organization or the rulership of the evil one. Let me tell you, people we are battling right now, battling by, you know, with all those schemes and those wiles of Satan that keeps on frustrating us and punishing us with disease and calamities and suppressing us. We don't enjoy the, you know, the, 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 the faithfulness of God because of the pressure. We are attacked with the disease, we are attacked with the calamities, we are attacked with many things. But let me tell you, God will have it sorted out when that time comes. But today, the Bible says we are kept by the power of God. As we keep following Christ, things happen in a different version altogether. What a joy that we've been able to sit together and understand that when the kingdom comes, there will be no rulership of Satan anymore. Remember, we are praying the need of God. Last time we prayed, allow it be your name. And we identified the need that is in the heart of God, that Israel will be saved because they didn't allow it the name of God. And now the second need is that the kingdom of God comes. Hallelujah. The order that God had intended from the beginning concerning man be inst installed. Hallelujah. And then the last, the last need is what we will be looking at. And then now after addressing the need of God, we will now begin to look at what God wants our needs to be. I want us to pray and thank you for tuning in this kingdom moments. Father, we thank you. Bless you for giving us an opportunity to be able to come with your word to the people. We pray that God, that one day the kingdom of God will come and that which you intended concerning man right from the beginning will be fulfilled. 
And once it is fulfilled, Lord, we know, God, in the order that you have set up, dear Lord, that there will be no more torture from Satan and his fallen angels against man. We thank you and we give you praise. And know, Lord, I'm speaking to people from different places. Lord, stretch your hand and touch those who are in need, those who are sick in their bodies, those others that are going through various problems. Lord, would you touch them in accordance with your word? We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. The Lord bless you. It's been such a blessing to have you with me in this program. Thank you so much for joining in.